Facebook Messenger. All right, so give me two seconds. It takes a while. Yeah. Uh, on my laptop? On your laptop, so you can see this, uh, the questions coming in, yes. Okay. Can I click that? Yeah, the, that's the link, the live link that you'll see the questions coming in because we're live now. Right. Is there a bit of? Oh no, it's it's okay, guys. It just uh, if you move the screen around, it, it you can hear a bit of a wind sound. So if you try not to touch the uh, the video link that we're on at the moment, that'd be good. Right. Uh, okay. Can you see that some of the people coming in on the right hand yeah. side there, Kaiser? Right. Great. Yes. Bear with us, guys. I'm just going to get this link out to social media, and we'll be right with you for a great q a but uh yeah as i do that so kaiser what have you you'll been up to about, since the last time we chatted you said you'll take about five minutes uh, before we uh start answering the questions uh no just a couple of minutes while i get out to social media and we'll just have a chat so but uh yeah what have you been up to since the last time we chatted it uh you know it must be uh what's it like Stop over down. there for covid <laughs> we have to talk Stop about down. that Do you have a fan on or anything over there uh, in your study there, Kaiser? Just because it sounds like there's a, some wind kind of blowing. Yeah, there's the air conditioner. Yeah, you can hear it's quite, it muffles the sound quite a lot at the moment. Um, it's not too much of a big deal, but uh, you can hear it coming in on the, uh, on the audio. There we go. It's off. Is that okay now? Yes, much better. I know you might be boiling for an hour, but... <laughs> yeah, I'll have to turn the fan on slow speed, right on top of my head. Right, Is that's that absolutely okay? fine. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Let me just try that. So hi guys who are joining us at the moment. Uh, if you get your questions in, I'm sure you know who Kaiser is already. Uh, he's a Pakistan Air Force legend and he's flown everything in the inventory from, uh, you know, the MiG-15, 17, uh, 21, F-16, the list goes on. So if you get your questions coming in, uh, that'd be great. Uh, but um, yeah, Kaiser, so what's, what's been happening on you, in your world since we last talked? What's, what's, what's new on your end? Well, nothing much. We were locked down and uh, I was more into uh, reading and writing, which is uh, also one of my passions. So that kept me busy. Otherwise, uh, I generally locked down all of the country, but things are sort of easing up now. Yes, yeah. Is it a, 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 like travel restrictions in your country at the moment? No, they're all gone. All oh, right, okay. In, in fact, no restrictions anymore as of about three days ago. Okay. And schools are opening, I think, in 15th, uh, on 15th September, and rest, everything is open. Wow. So as we get like a few people in here, um, if you can give us a bit of background, uh, just you know, a couple of minutes summary of what you've flown in your Air Force career. I mean, we could go on for ages here, but just to give people a summary of what you did, uh, just in case they well, haven't watched the initial interview. Well, uh, I joined the Air Force in 1973, started flying in 1974 at the Academy, uh, flew the Harvards, the T6Gs that is, and after a short while, we had to switch over to the Swedish uh, MFI-17 uh, primary uh, piston trainer and then T-37, the jet trainer. And after about 20 hours or so and three years at the academy, we moved on to fighter conversion on the MiG-17, the dual-seater. That's the only dual-seater. China makes only uh, made only uh, the MiG-17 dual-seater. No other country uh, made, made a dual-seater. 
From there, we progressed on to the MiG-19, that was the H-6. But the H-6, during our time, didn't have a dual-seater. So we had to switch back to the MiG-15. Not the 17, but the 15. Mm-hmm. And the checkouts, the instrument flying, night checkouts, those were done on the MiG-15. And then we were just launched for the first time on the H-6, up in the air. Uh, flew F-6s for about uh, 300 hours before moving back to the academy as an instructor at age 24. I was actually training students at age 24 on the T-37 and I was lucky to stay on for four years uh, on the T-37 because I joined the uh, aerobatics team, the Shear Dills, uh, the Lionhearts, so, uh, which was just a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, stayed there for four years and then at that time, uh, that's 1982, I left the academy and uh, switched to the Mirages, which I hadn't flown earlier, the Mirage 3 and 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't have the F-16s at that time. Uh, soon after conversion, uh, in 1983, the F-16s started to come in. And uh, flew about 800 hours on the Mirages, and then moved on to the F-16. That's about in 1985. Uh, again, did about 500 hours on the F-16, and at that time I was uh, detailed to go to Qatar with the Qatari Air Force. They were short of instructors. They wanted uh, somebody with the F-16 background and a QFI qualified flying instructor at the academy. So I switched over to the Mirage F-1, which is quite an aircraft. Uh, flew that for three years. Uh, Qatar is a small country, so uh, despite uh, the lots of fuel that the aircraft had, we didn't have uh, much of area, so the sortie time duration was quite less. So we didn't fly more than 300 hours uh, over there on the F-1. Uh, came back and commanded a Mirage squadron at uh, Karachi. Uh, this was uh, the maritime attack squadron with the Exocet uh, missile. Mm-hmm. And they did a staff job, went to the war college as an instructor, uh, went to air headquarters uh, as director of operations and then back as the OC of the flying wing where I had uh, three squadrons, the MiG-21, uh, F-7s and the Mirages. And then back to the air headquarters again for a short stint and then back again as the base commander at uh, Masrur, which is the largest base I'm told in Asia. Wow. Huge base. Uh, we've got about 70 aircraft over there, and uh, I could fly, since I'd flown all, so it was my choice. One morning I'd fly the F-7, the next morning I'd fly the Mirage, and uh, so that was about 28, 27 years of flying that I did in my 30-year career, and retired in 2005. So flown about a dozen aircraft, dozen uh, aircraft, uh, these were Chinese, these were uh, Chinese of Russian origin, American, uh, French. So that's what I did. Uh, I got a short break in China for evaluating the F 7PG, that's a double delta wing uh, aircraft. Though I wasn't a test pilot, but in our times, uh, we could sort of uh, do it the crude way, just uh, take the aircraft to the limits and uh, the speeds and heights and turn rate and so on, its uh, capabilities at low altitude, uh, some weapon weapon firing, and uh, you just sort of okay the aircraft, and this one turned out to be a good one, and it's still flying the Air Force. So I was the first one to fly the F-7PG in China, known as MG over there, but with a few modifications, it became the F-7PG, which is still flying. So that's what I did uh, in the Air Force. Well, not a bad career at all, guys. I mean, I, I like the, the the point you made there. Yeah, you just you could you know pick what you wanted to fly that morning. <laughs> it's like, that's incredible. But uh, as you see, there's some questions coming in on the side. So if you remember, you can scroll up, uh, Kaiser, or on the sidebar where the questions are, so you don't miss any. Um, if you let me know if you can see that. There's lots of hellos. Hello, everyone. I'll start with. Um... What do you think will be the answer of Rafal from Pakistan Air Force? Perfect. Yeah, I'll keep politics aside. Both the Rafal and the 
JS-17 are uh, formidable aircraft, so is the F-16. Uh, we don't see any problems. Uh, I can, uh, I think there are other people also asking similar questions. So uh, I'll attend to this one first, and I think uh, that should hold good for quite a few others. Uh, a few points I'd like to make first about the Rafale, that it's a formidable aircraft, but comes at a cost. The unit cost is about $100 million, and the Indians have bought the whole program for $780 billion. So there's a whole lot of money. So if you include the program cost with the space, with the back shops, with all uh, the uh, ancillaries that go with the aircraft, turns out to be $220 million per aircraft. Now, on the other hand, the JF-17 is just $25 million. I'll tell you about the capabilities shortly. But for the price of one, one unit cost Rafale, we can buy four of these JF-17s. That's point number one. Number two, we've been flying the JF-17 for the last uh, 10 years at least. It was fully operationally capable uh, in 2011. 10, in fact, started flying in 2010 in squadrons. And we have loads of experience on the JF-17, whereas the Rafale is just entering uh, service in the Indian Air Force. So just keeping th these two points in mind, uh, since I haven't flown either the JF-17 or uh, nor the uh, Rafale, I can only make a line comparison, which any fighter pilot can do. So I'll just based on my experience, I'll give my points of view about uh, these two aircraft. Let's start with the JF-17 versus the Rafale, uh, the JF-17 has a thrust-to-weight ratio pretty much the same as the Rafale, one is to one. Rafale is 1.1 is to 0, 1.1, 1.05 uh, is to one, the JF-17 is one is to one, that's pretty much the same. Uh, the wing loading, that's the total weight per unit area on the wings, is also pretty much the same if you take into account that the JF-17 has huge big strikes the leading edge uh, extensions. So on that count, uh, the wing loading determines the turn rate. So both have more or less the same turn rate. Where the JF-17 uh, has a huge edge is the aspect ratio. Aspect ratio determines this is the uh, readout of the lift to drag ratio. What is the lifting capability? And that is immense. Uh, the Rafale is a very big wing produces a lot of lift, but produces a lot of drag as well. The JF-17 doesn't have the pro any, any such problem. So in a turning fight, we're talking of now close combat turning fight, the JF-17 will be a winner, given the same experience of pilots on both sides. Uh, there's no problem at all. As far as uh, close combat, I would agree with anyone who uh, has a point about this. They, Close combat is on its way out, as was clearly demonstrated uh, on 27 February, and that's my personal contention too. Uh, BVR is the name of the game. So in BVR, uh, of course, the JF-17 and the F-16 both are BVR equipped. The JF-17 is up for an uh, upgrade. The Block 3 you must have heard of. Block 3 will be a ESR radar, electronically scanned radar, and the PL-15. Now, MBDA, which makes the Meteor missile claim more than 100 kilometers. The Chinese claim more than 100 kilometers for the PL-15-2. So now we have the Rafale and the JF-17 with HR radars and with equal capability weapons. So in the BVR arena, I think both are quite similar, despite the fact that the JF-17 is much smaller. Of course, it has a different role. Uh, agreed that the Rafale has more range, it has more endurance, it has two engines, more survivability, but the fact is that for one Rafale we can buy four. So these are some of my viewpoints about these two aircraft. Uh, we can now move on to The next question, uh, Freckle Puny 
I've just answered your question. Uh, without starting a flame war, how do you rate the JF-17 against the Tejas? Okay, Tejas. Uh, again, uh, you know, not having flown the JF-17, I'm not quite in a position to compare, but I can do a valid, I think reasonably valid uh, assessment of uh, both these aircraft. They are generally of similar capability, but the Tejas has one major drawback, according to me, and that is being a delta wing. The aspect ratio is the worst ever of any fighter aircraft designed, any jet fighter designed since after the World War. Now, that's a huge statement that I made, but that's a fact. It impacts turn rates, turning capability, takeoff distances, and landing distances. So there, they just get beaten. Other than that, they are of the same class. So uh, I just sort of finish at that. Uh, in, in, in air combat, in a turning fight, the JF-17 GF, will definitely have an edge on the Tejas. As far as the PVR weapons are concerned, we're not sure which ones Tejas uh, has at the moment. Uh, the JF-17, as I said, would have the PL-15, which is 100 kilometers plus range. Hello, Point. During BFM training, what was your favorite crew to fly against or with? Uh, I don't understand that. Are you talking about uh, the person, uh, the name of the person or what? Not sure about that. Ah, Mohammed Zia. Is there a chance that Park Navy gets a dedicated air arm wing in the near future? I answered this question today in a talk to the War College. I can repeat that. Pakistan Navy does not have an integral air element in the shape of an aircraft carrier. So therefore, they have to depend on the Pakistan Air Force for anti-surface or the shipping, anti-shipping uh, in the anti-shipping role. They already have this capability in the helicopters, in the long range maritime patrol aircraft, but not the fighters. Now, I want to emphasize that a fighter is a multi-role aircraft these days. It just doesn't do anti-shipping. It can do close support, battlefield interdiction, armed reconnaissance, photo reconnaissance, air defense alert, uh, it can patrol, carry out fighter sweeps, carry out fighter escorts, at least a dozen roles. Now, the Navy wanting these costly fighters only for a single role is not fair. It's not economical. So for that good reason, I think uh, these uh, aircraft must stay with the Air Force. And the other thing is that if the Navy just has one squadron, who are they going to train against for dissimilar air combat training? Pakistan Air Force? So they send the pilots to the Pakistan Air Force for the similar air combat training, for combat commander's course, for fighter conversion, for operational conversion, for basic training, they have to, they can't, uh, you know, have parallel organizations. So for everything, they have to send pilots for their training to and the engineers to the Pakistan Air Force. As far as the aircraft are concerned, they also have to be maintained by the Air Force. The engines, the overall of the aircraft, so what's the whole point? Training with the Pakistan Air Force, maintenance of the aircraft with the Pakistan Air Force, so might as well leave this aircraft with the Pakistan Air Force. We can do the job for the Army and the Navy. That's uh, my point about the dedicated air arm for the Navy. How close to the F-16 is the JF-17? In what areas is the JF-17 superior, other than acquisition costs? Uh, remember, the JF-17 came about 30 years after the F-16. The F-16 first flew in 1978. The JF-17 flew in 2004 or 5. So many, many years later. So it's a newer, it's newer technology. Uh, it's got one of the most advanced cockpits. Fly-by-wire, excellent uh, lifting capability of the wings. The wings are a copy of the F-16, the straights are a copy of the F-18, the vertical tail is a copy of the Gripen. 
So it's uh, quite a hybrid and an extremely capable aircraft. So I think they're at par. Load carrying capability, of course, the stations on the F-16 are more. Uh, nine of them and seven of them on the uh, GF-17. Other than that, and range-wise, of course, the Prop 52 has immense range uh, compared to the GF-17. So uh, depending on their capabilities, they will be used in uh, areas where they, could, they perform best. So uh, I think both are good in the roles that they are likely to perform. Have you flown the uh, JF-17? That's uh, Afnan Mohammed. No, I have not. I wish I had. Zigzag. This question is out of course. What do you make of the Beirut explosion? Have you heard or tried digital combat simulator? No. During our days, there were no simulators. They were just basic instrument flying simulators. And we haven't done any simulator flying, at least during my tenure, till I retired in 2005. It was hands-on in the cockpit all the time. Jerwin Janssen. Could you elaborate a bit about the differences in handling characteristics and layouts between French, American, and Chinese designs? Uh, I personally think the American uh, cockpits and the layouts were as good as they come. Perfect, no problems. The French were also pretty good. Uh, there were some idiosyncrasies uh, compared to the American ones, but one gets used to them. The Chinese designs of yesteryears uh, were very different. Uh, the instrument layout was uh, sort of random. There were no circuit breakers. You had switches, the on-off switches like you have in your homes, uh, big ones. Uh, the cockpits were extremely tight. You had to be sort of shoehorned into the cockpit. Um, so uh, I think Americans were the best, the French, uh, and were as good almost. The Chinese, now they have learned a lot. Now the JF-17 cockpit, which was of course uh, designed with the help of Pakistanis who had learned uh, things from uh, the F-16s, with their experience on the F-16. Uh, the JF-17 is as good as the Raptor. Anyone has had a look at the JF-17 cockpit he might think he is sitting in a raptor. Uh, Mohammed Zia, what do you think is the perfect stopgap solution for the PA for a strike aircraft as most menages are nearing the end of the lives? Um, as you might be aware, uh, one squadron of mirages or, uh, or the F-7 is being replaced by the JF-17 every year. So in about five years' time, it will just be a F-16 and JF-17 Air Force. So these aircraft are the ones that will replace the Mirages and the F-7s. Uh, Zarar Khan, sir, in your opinion, should Pakistan have good enough plans to counter security threats, security threats or should we look for other plans, another plan? We are ready. All I can say is uh, we have no issues. Uh, we are ready. We are prepared. Uh, each country has its security plans and uh, we are up to date, I think. No more comments on that. Air Force guy says he... I hope you're doing well. Yes, I am doing well by the grace of God. I have a couple of questions for you and I don't see your questions, so we can wait. Maybe they're down. Jin Zhang, have you ever done dissimilar BFM against MiG-21s or Mirai 2000s? No, I haven't. Uh, Mohammed Zia, are the handful of C-130s and IL-76 enough for the BF as compared to IF's fleet of C-17s? India is a huge country, six or seven times bigger than us in area. So uh, for our needs, 
June 30, IL-76 are more than adequate. Freckle penny. Latest F7 versus upgraded MiG-21. Uh, the latest F7 is the F7PG, as you might know. Uh, it has a radar and it has short range weapons. Uh, it doesn't have BVR weapons. Uh, the upgraded MiG-21, if you're talking about the Bison, it is uh, a fairly capable aircraft. But you saw what happened on 27th February, so capability is always in relation to who is the opponent. So we will pit the most capable aircraft against the uh, adversaries. I can assure you about that. Are there plans for indigenous BVR, BVRAM by the air weapon complex classified? No comments. Uh, top comment, any notable moments learning to fly the MiG-21? The landing looks very fast and scary. Uh, I started to fly the MiG-21s when I was a group captain uh, commanding a flying wing and I had loads of experience in different types. So for me, it wasn't scary at all. And I had experience in the Mirage, which I think the Mirage 3 and 5 uh, their landing speeds are some of the fastest in the world. So used to those kind of landing speeds, MiG-21 was uh, not difficult at all. Have the PF personnel acquainted with the Katri Rafals? Uh, can't answer that. Uh, Jin Zhang, can you describe how you integrate your original US based training for F 16 to the local airspace operation requirements in the India Pakistan theater? Uh, it was no problem at all. Uh, if I get your question right, the no local airspace issues, no operational issues, uh, switching from training in USA uh, and uh, switching over back to the Pakistan Air Force were no problems. We were able to, uh, actually the Americans were quite surprised how quickly we had uh, learned to fly the F-16 and uh, make it fully operational in within, within a few months actually. Uh, have you flown with and against in a friendly sense, of course, the USAF French Air Force RAF and what were your experiences? I've flown against the USAF, these exercises were named Midlink way back in the 70s and later on against the F-18s. I got, uh, got a chance to fly against the F-18s, uh, Canadian F-18s, when I was in uh, Qatar for uh, three years flying the Mirage F-1. Uh, the experience was that uh, we were excellent at close combat. The Americans were absolutely surprised. Every exercise that we had flown, uh, whatever aircraft they were flying, the F-16, or the F-15, uh, the F-18, uh, they couldn't imagine that uh, a Pakistani Air Force pilot would fly the F-6 the way we were doing. There were many instances of uh, PF pilots taking shots on the F-15. In fact, there's a very famous shot of an F-16 being uh, shot down, of course, on film uh, by an F-6. So our experience has been very interesting and we have done some tail bashing. Uh, Mohammed Zia, you asked too many questions, but I'll answer this one and we'll wait a while before I answer the next one for you. Is the Azam a totally indigenous aircraft or is there a plan for joint venture with Turkey and or China? Uh, there's always collaboration uh, between countries. Look at the Typhoon, the Eurofighter. Uh, it's a joint project of four countries. France decided to go alone. Many other countries have uh, thought it's not feasible, both economically and operationally. So for a country which is uh, new to designing aircraft, I mean, we had uh, partial design 
and development uh, role in the JS-17, and I'm quite sure there'll be similar uh, collaboration with some friendly countries. Uh, as far as Azum is concerned, I do not think uh, fifth generation aircraft can be completely made uh, without years and years of experience. So probably it'll be a joint project. Now this SU-30 hit, uh, I think you better ask some Indian guy about it. Uh, I've written about it quite clearly, about uh, 27, so I don't want to get into a flame war over here. Uh, the results are quite obvious. Uh, Air Force guy, MiG-21 or SU-30, I didn't get uh, the question, I don't know what you're asking, which is better or I'm not sure about that. Uh, my second Air Force guy, my second question is, is there a plan of procuring more F-16s from US to enhance the size of the present fleet? Yes, we'd love to if the Americans decide to stop sanctions. Right now, since 1966, we are under the eighth set of sanctions. We can't work like that. That's a pretty blunt, straight question, uh, straight answer to your question. Uh, you know, collaboration doesn't work like that. Uh, Anglo-Spanish racing. Kasher, hope you are well. Very briefly compare the MiG-21 and the Mirage. Uh, I would say well, since I've flown both the MiG-21, that's the F-7 and the Mirage, uh, the roles were different. Uh, Mirage doesn't have an elevator. The MiG-21 is a tail delta. So in close combat, MiG-21 versus Mirage or the F-7 versus Mirage, uh, no problem at all uh, shooting down a Mirage or beating a Mirage up in the air. A Mirage can best hit and run because of uh, its relatively poor capability versus uh, MiG-21 or the F-7. Uh, Aru Tripathi, uh, sir, in Indian here, yeah, I know, uh, I can guess uh, from your name. Did you participate in any wars in India, uh, with India? Uh, no, I did not. I joined the Air Force in 1973. And the last war I had seen was 1970. Seen, I was in uh, school, college at the time in 1971. So I don't have any war experience. Mohammed, I've already answered too many questions, so let's give a chance to others. Uh, Veel Punjabi. Uh, I don't know what's the question. Hassan Salman. Sir, on different social media platforms and unofficial PF groups, they are hinting for J10s. Is PF looking forward to induct? it in the near future. Well, I can give my personal point of view, and that is that because of uh, funding issues, uh, we'd like to maintain the focus on the JF-17 Block 3. And once all F-7s and Mirages are replaced by the JF-17, we might think of something else. At this stage, if we sort of lose focus, uh, that will not be fair to the program, the JF-17 program, the replacement program. Freckle Penny, given the F-35 is the only game in town for the Americans, the high cost of Rafale uh, Typhoon in the same ballpark, do you think it will be exclusively China for the foreseeable future? Are you asking that uh, China is going to be the only... Uh, I didn't get that question actually. Do you think it will be exclusively China for the foreseeable future? As far as enemies are concerned, yes, China will be, uh, you know, adversary of the Americans for quite some time. But where you fit these aircraft in, I, I didn't quite understand the question, please. Jin Zhang, I think you are a Pakistani. That's my guess. Can you describe flying the Mirage 3 or Mirage 5 in BFM as far as flying characteristics are concerned? Uh, as I said, these uh, fighters uh, do not have the Mirage 3 and 5, do not have an elevator, and they 
Elevon itself, which is part of the wing, when it is deflected uh, upwards, you lose lift. So the lifting capability is not as good as any tailed Delta or any fighter with a tail or even a canard. So these are good multi-role aircraft, excellent for strikes, but not as good versus other aircraft in air combat. Unless, of course, you're smart and you can hit and run. Uh, in 1971, Mirages shot down three Indian aircraft, by the way. Could you please comment on the turning radius of the F-16 with GF-17? A comparison, if you would please. That's mad Irishman. Uh, both are pretty much the same. Uh, Yawar, of course. How are you, Yawar? Uh, how much did the logistics support system that we learned after induction of F-16 ended up improving the logistics support system for Mirage's F-7 later on immensely? There was great learning. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why we've been able to stretch the operability of Mirages and F-7s for as long as, uh, you know, 2020 is because we learned hell of a lot from the logistics and support system of the F-16. That's a great contribution of that system, which helped us, you know, um, use the same procedures and same systems for the Mirages and F-7s. So it was great learning. Will, how do you compare the Proc 52 F-16 against the Eurofighter? Is payload of the F-16 in a weaker spot? Now, remember, the F-16 is a single engine aircraft. The Eurofighter and the Rafale, they are, and several others, the, the F-18, they are twin engine aircraft with different roles. They are big aircraft. So the payload is more, the range is more, the weapons load is more, the fuel is more. In 2019, PFF-16s received an update package from the U.S. Could you please elaborate on them? If it's not come out in the news, must be confidential, so I am not privy to it, and I can't discuss that. Uh, Anglo-Spanish racing, welcome. Arud Tripathi, thank you uh, so much for your reply. Well, thank you, Arud. Air Force guy, thank you. I hope these type of inter interactions will continue in future as well. Well, it depends on Mike, how often he invites me here. So, Hail, SU, two SU-37s, how the radar blocking systems help them in air combat? Uh, I don't know. You better ask the Indians about that. Uh, Jerwin Janssen, I think it sounds Swedish your name. Uh, anyway, the most enjoyable plane to fly uh, was, of course, the F-16. Uh, I still continue to be fascinated with it. And uh, two years ago, I flew the F-16 after 30 years. The last I flew was 1989, and I again flew it in uh, 2018, 2019, in fact. Uh, enjoy it, thoroughly enjoyed it, and still continue to be fascinated with it. A 30 degree reclining seat, stick on the side, fly by wire, unstable aircraft, computers control it, make it flyable. Uh, so just loved, uh, you know, flying. One of the best fighters ever, uh, I think, or at least the one that I've flown. Thanks for your time, best from Caribbean. Good luck to you. Um, what can you say about the floggers against the F-16s? They're no good. Haris Malik, there are eyeless landings common in fighter jets or do you prefer visual? Well, Pakistan, unlike Europe, is a bright sunny country and we have cloudy weather mostly in uh, June and July, uh, July and August, the monsoons. Other than that, the sunny days are uh, quite common, so visual landings are generally done, but of course, all pilots are proficient in eyeless landings, and even if the weather is bright and clear, uh, they do eyeless landings uh, as a matter of procedure. 
Aruj, that's a very interesting question. How good can Rafal be as an opponent? My answer to that is never underestimate the enemy. Oh, here we are friends. I, I should have used the word adversary. Never underestimate the adversary. Freckle Puni. I meant, will it be China as far as an exclusive partner and source for the PF? Hard to post detailed questions. Sometimes there's 200 character limit. I understand that. Okay, now it's clear to me. Yes, China has been a reliable partner since 1966 when we started getting the F6s from them. We've had no problem whatsoever, no spares problem, no overall problem. Of course, we have our own overall setup for the F6. We had it for the F6, we have it for the F7. We had no sanctions whatsoever. Uh, we've had excellent relationship politically, so there's no differences. If there were any minor differences or hiccups here and there, they were settled. Uh, no sort of military spares or support was stopped ever. So China is a very reliable country. And yes, we will continue to uh, source not just the Pakistan Air Force, but the Army and the Navy as well. Uh, and uh, collaboration, joint collaboration, production of aircraft and hardware will continue. It's been a success, a total success. Cookie Club, sir, do you foresee another IF and PF skirmish similar to February 2019? Well, we don't have any intentions. I can't say about the adversary. Uh, Mohammed Marek, any information about aircraft carrier for the Pakistan Navy? Uh, I believe these are, you know, if you just buy one or two, you have to have a huge uh, carrier task force with them, which becomes unaffordable. So it's more of a show of power thing than, uh, you know, and it's very vulnerable. So I don't think Pakistan Navy has any plans for the time being. Uh, but I'm a blue suitor, I was a blue suitor, so I can't talk on behalf of the Pakistan Navy. But my personal opinion is this is a costly white elephant. We might as well stay away from it. Nabil Nasser, your views on Chinese J-20? Well, I know only what I've read in the magazines, which is pretty much what you might have read. Uh, I'm not privy to since I'm retired, I haven't uh, had closer interaction than reading newspapers and magazines. So my assessment is not quite up to date or up to speed about the J20. Oh, Johnson. Yeah, it's a touch name. OK. Uh, Humair Ali Khan, your assessment on Indian edge after getting Rafal over PF, where PF needs to improve. Uh, you're asking some classified questions, which, of course, I can't answer. But I have answered in earnest, honestly, honesty, that uh, the JF-17 and the F-16 together are the right answer to the Rafale. It's another matter that Rafale can carry, one Rafale can carry more load, twice as much as the JF-17, or you know, a little more than the F-16, and it has more fuel than the JF-17. But come BVR fight or a within visual range fight, it's at par. Uh, I watched your lecture where you told that during ejection, the pilot faces approximately 30 to 40 Gs for a second. Does it affect your body too for ending up broken with uh, internal bleeding and so on? Uh, I do not recall, I said 30 or 40 Gs, maybe there was a mistake. It's generally about in the region of 20 to 25 Gs. And not for a second, it's a fraction of a second. And the force is quite immense, you black out. And if the posture during ejection is not uh, correct, you're likely to, as has happened in many cases, injure your, not break your backbone, but certainly injure your backbone. And the pilots have been uh, grounded for as much as six months to a year after ejection. Uh, Rafakat Vazir, what do you think the best choice for Pakistan Air Force in current fighter jets? More JF-17s. Replace all F7s and Mirages with GF-17s, and then that'll be about five years from now, and then talk about some newer aircraft if you want to. Uh, 
uh, mad Irish pen. JF-17 Block 3 will be equipped with ESA radars. What is the timeline on having all JF-17s and Air Force inventory to be equipped with ESA radars? Well, I can tell you that the production rate of uh, the Pakistan Aeronautical Complex is 24 aircraft per year. So you can just work it out for yourself. We need about 150 more of them. We already have about 110. Ah, Afnan Mohammed, are you going to fly in the JF-17 or in the back seat? Maybe as the dual seat version is out. Do you have any idea what's my age? And whether they'd like to take a chance? Personally, I'd love to fly it. Uh, LGN oil. Lima Golf, November, Delta Hotel, Lima, Sierra, Tango, whatever that is. Hi, Kesha. Any chance of a book detailing Afghan Soviet campaign? There seems to be very little written about this. Well, enough has been written in an official history of the Air Force. Every 10 years is a new history book that comes out. And the last uh, the uh, one that covered the 90s has all the details. Uh, it's not come out, it's been issued by the book club for the officers of the Pakistani Air Force. It's not come out in the market, but I'm sure you can lay your hand. If you're a Pakistani, you can lay your hand on the book through some of your friends. Uh, why it's not come out? I can pass on your sentiment to the air headquarters that yes, you know, this Afghan uh, Soviet campaign lasted quite a few years and we shot down as many as five or six aircraft. So it must be published for the general public. So I'll pass on your message to the ones I know at the air headquarters. Uh, Jinjiang, uh, I'm not aware of the updates made, uh, the, you know, the TCAS kind of updates made to the F-16s after I flew. During my time, they're not there. I think there were some uh, additions or some modifications made later on with the midlife upgrade. I do not know the details. Aruj Tripathi. Sir, do you think someday both of our countries will have a joint exercise? I'm an Air Force aspirant and I really look forward to it. And these talks really inspire me. Inspire me, I guess that's what he's saying. Uh, <clears throat> We'd love to have peace in South Asia, but I don't see it coming any soon. For the reasons that might be apparent to you as much as they are to me. Uh, joint exercise, I remember once there were foreign diplomats who had attended, uh, who came to visit the Air War College where was the, I was the deputy commandant. And uh, the Indian Air Attaché was the chief of that delegation that visited the war college in my speech uh, i said the indians are welcome to send students to our war college and everyone had a good laugh so i hope we don't laugh about this matter anymore and we can actually have uh, friendlier terms but uh, i think the way things are unfortunately uh, i don't see that happening anytime soon uh, Yawar, my view, F-16 squadrons in 80s were said to be much more demanding for pilots than F-6 Mirage squadrons. These pilots formed a disproportionate part of the air board. Uh, I don't know if I got your question right, but the fact of the matter was that uh, at that time, the F-16, when we got it, we got it only two years after the USAF. And it was the world's most advanced aircraft. So the demands laid on the pilots were equivalent. When you're flying the world's best fighter, you better be the best. And to be the best, the air staff uh, were, I think, right in demanding more from the pilots. Uh, is it correct to say, Yawar again, is it correct to say that the F-16 experience ultimately brought a cultural shift in the Pakistan Air Force? Yes, it did. A huge shift 
Flight safety improved, as you just mentioned earlier, or you'd asked in a question. Logistic support improved immensely. All systems benefited. The pilots learned new techniques, new tactics. Because the F-16, if the F-16 hadn't been there, we wouldn't have flown the Mirages or the F-7s or the F-6s at that time uh, the way we did. So uh, there was a major shift. Uh, as far as the cultural shift, you know, you, uh, F-16s, the impact in the social on the socio-cultural scene, you might have seen trucks and buses in Pakistan and rickshaws in Pakistan with the F-16 painted the back. Anything good in Pakistan was F-16. It had to be represented by an F-16. That's Krishna Jaga, I think. Hi, sir. I've been interacting with you for many years now and been fascinated with your historical narratives. Been very curious to hear a bit more about your cycling hobby in the travel bug. Well, uh, after retirement, I got demoted from a tricycle to a bicycle. Uh, so that was a sort of a step down, uh, I should say. But uh, after retirement, of course, I took up, I decided not to fly for an airline. I had better interests for which I never had the time while, while I was in the Air Force. Uh, so cycling, uh, traveling, uh, astronomy, bird watching, bird shooting, photography, writing, all those things, they're uh, great fun and I enjoy them. And I recommend these hobbies highly for those who are no more in the blues, retired that is. Sir, how soon are we likely to see JF-17 Block 3 in public, the Air Force Day? Well, I hope so next uh, 23rd March. Bruce Gordon, which aircraft has the best radar capability? Bruce, I wonder if you're asking about the Pakistan Air Force. Uh, obviously, I don't know about uh, other Air Forces or other aircraft that I haven't flown. Uh, both the F-16 and the JF-17 have excellent radars. Uh, generally, it was believed the Chinese stuff isn't as good as Western, but believe me, uh, they're at par. Chinese have come a long way, and you just wait for the ESA radar that's coming up, and I can tell you uh, it'll be as good as any Western radar. So, so for the time being, the real AI uh, radars that we have in the Air Force, capable ones are with the, on the F-16 and the uh, JF-17. Abdullah Azhar, does tall height contribute to the failure of medical test for fighter pilots? And if so, then what is the height limit for being a fighter pilot? Now, that's an interesting question. Uh, the issue was on Chinese aircraft where people with not tall heights, but bigger torsos, taller torsos, uh, their head would touch the canopy and there was no uh, the can they, they, uh, there was no uh, canopy piercers. They were ineffective, and we had a number of injuries because of uh, the pilot's helmet hitting the canopy first. Uh, so uh, pilots having such a problem, everyone is taken in. There are no upper height limits, but anyone who is found to have a torso that is uh, more than what is required, he's moved on to another aircraft. There are people who have skipped the F-7, and they've uh, gone on to Mirages or the F-16s directly because of the torso issue. Uh, Yogan Suryan Naik. It's a shame India and Pakistan have to be enemies. We are the same people, both victims of colonialism, only separated by religion. But in fact, that's a poor excuse. We should reunite and be one people. Uh, I don't want to, want to get into a political debate. Yes, it is a shame that, uh, you know, we are enemies. I'd love to see uh, India as our friend, but unfortunately that's not happening anytime soon, as I mentioned a while ago. We were victims of colonialism, only separated by religion. Yes, that is the fundamental difference between the two. Religions are different. For us, it's a way of life, a complete way of life, where we thought we couldn't get along or at least the political rights of the minority religion in your country uh, would not have been addressed properly. So we opted to 
part. But that's not an excuse for enmity. We'll have to be friends again. Uh, pass this message on to your Prime Minister, please. Umar Ali Khan, how much PF is improving in UAV technology? Well, we are actually manufacturing them and it will be very soon when we have armed UAVs. Yogan Suri Naik, uh, uh, like I said, I don't want to get into a political discussion. We're talking about the air forces and air operations and air wars and aircraft. So I'll skip that question. And we are also uh, discussing something similar, so we'll keep that out. Uh, Jin Zhang, TCAS is avoiding, yeah, I know, I know TCAS is avoiding collision between aircraft, not collision with terrain. I understand that. Uh, generally, uh, fighters, TCAS is for, for airliners. Fighter pilots keep their eyes open. They better have them open, uh, otherwise you'll have collisions. And plus the TKS equipment in a tight aircraft, you know, which jam packed with equipment is, uh, is, is a tall order to fit everything with a system in a fighter aircraft. Zippel Penguin, is Pakistan going to buy a Turkish or Chinese fifth generation aircraft? Which one do you think would be better? Well, let it come out. I can't make a comment. These are, you know, they're in the design stage, so I can't uh, say much about the capabilities. The specs have not come out in public. Haris Malik, in the Soviet war, one of our wingmen shot down another F-16 by mistake using an AM-9. There wasn't much information regarding this. Could you enlighten uh, a bit more? Yes, it was poor visibility and it happens. It has happened in every Air Force and every conflict. Fratricide does take place. Uh, nothing very... Uh, uh, it just happened to be poor visibility in the leader who shot his number two thought this fellow was an uh, enemy aircraft. A mistake that uh, happens once in a while. Jürgen, you're a peacenik. Nobel Prize for you, for peace. Will Sergi, uh, can Pakistan itself support the F-16 or Turkish support or is US permission needed for everything related to the F-16 classified? Unable to answer this one. Uh, Waxville, is it true that due to economic conditions, the PF limit the flying hours of the fast jets? That's sheer propaganda. PF pilots fly pretty much as much as NATO pilots, 180 hours at least per month. Block four, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about uh, that. That's from Cookie Club. Arush Tripathi, yes, sorry for my spelling mistake, never mind. Freckel Puni, how often do Indian MiG-21, 25s violate Pakistani airspace and how did you counter them? Israeli famously got the F-15 and the Iranians, the F-14, the Phoenix to counter the Fox Bat. Doesn't happen too often. That's my simple answer. Uh, what's your favorite squadron and why are the Griffins 9th squadron known as the elite? Well, 9th squadron is one of the oldest, the oldest squadron. It participated in the Second World War. So there is a certain elitist air about anyone who serves in that squadron. And my favorite squadron was eight because I commanded that one. So Kaiser, um, yes, I, I think I, I'm going to let you pick one more question and then we're going to briefly chat about your books. So like, if you can pick one more, that'll be absolutely great for our viewers. Okay, the last one. Uh, mad Irishman, why has Pakistan Air Force never looked into procuring a dual engine jet? Is it mainly because of the operational cost or Air Force never felt the need? Uh, the need of uh, dual engine aircraft is very much there in every Air Force, uh, particularly if you have a large coastline, 
long coastline and uh, we have the Arabian Sea, of course. It's so much nicer to have a second engine if you have a failure for whatever reason and you can come back because uh, there's no way you can, you know, land uh, at sea. You just have to punch out. Whereas if you're on land, you can save the aircraft. So if you have a dual engine uh, aircraft, you can bring it back to the base. But then remember, dual engine aircraft are costly. And for countries like ours, uh, we have to make do with single engine aircraft, which are fairly cheap, at least half as cheap uh, as, a, as a sort of a thumb rule. Uh, Mike, uh, that was the last one, as you said. Perfect, Kaiser. So, but uh, obviously our, our viewers will know you have a few books out, but do you have them handy and where we can get them from? Right. Uh, you'll see a mirror image. I don't know if you can uh, see this one. This is Great Air Battles of Pakistan Air Force. This was published in 2005, a Pakistani publication. Uh, you might find an odd copy on Amazon or eBay, but it's not in print anymore. Uh, that's about the Great Air Battles, about, I think, uh, 12 of them, 10 about 1965 and two or three about 1971. Uh, the turning and burning fights, not just the straight interception. And my second book uh, was published two years ago. Uh, that is In the Ring and On Its Feet. That is a compliment that was paid by the author of the official Indian history. They said that the end, at the end of the war, Pakistan Air Force was still in the ring and on its feet. That's a boxing term where you've not been knocked out. The circumstances in 1971, as uh, most of us uh, know, were not very favorable. Yet the Pakistan Air Force was able to put up a good fight and we were at par. So this, is bo this, is, uh, this book is all about 1971 air war. Mm -hmm. And that too is a Pakistani publication. Uh, it can be found on the net, but uh, about six months ago, or actually a year ago, Helion of UK, they republished this book uh, under a new title that was Against All Odds. And that is available. Uh, it's, uh, it can be purchased online at the Helion site or through Amazon or eBay. And I tried to get the picture up in here, but unfortunately it's not working. So I'm going to show our viewers uh, the Against All Odds cover, which has got some brilliant artwork. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, let me know if you can. Uh, is that the one that's coming? That's the uh, that's the new version, is it, uh, Kaiser? Yeah, it's already been published. It's out. already been published, yeah. And that's available on Amazon. Uh, and do, do, do. And the we also... And we also, uh, before we leave, because uh, me and Kaiser were chatting today, uh, he has a brilliant story. He got, he sent me, I can't get the, I've got some pictures. I'll try and get them up, guys, but our system is not working. Just before we go, you have to tell us about that, uh, your letters from Neil Armstrong. We have to talk about that, Kaiser. So tell me what was all that about. That was great. So I'm going to show you the letters first. So here's number one. I don't know if you can see them. Um, da, da, da. I don't think you can, guys. Oh no! No, I'll, 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 I will. I will publish them on our social media sites. But uh, yeah, Kaiser got some great um, letters, uh, personal messages from Neil Armstrong. So quickly tell us about that because that sounds like an amazing story. That was 1970, about six months after the moon landing. I was in class nine age uh, 15 years at a boarding school it was a cadet college boarding school and every two weeks or so we were supposed to write a letter home to our parents that all is well and during the prep study time somebody reminded me that uh, letters were being collected that day and suddenly i realized i hadn't written a letter to my parents because there was not much to write about and i just skipped and uh, you know you get fined or punished actually if you don't write a letter so i quickly tore off a page from my notebook and just out of naughtiness i said since i don't have anything to write about to my parents let me write to neil armstrong the first man on the moon 
And the usual stuff, you know, I was impressed and I followed your mission and uh, great job done, blah, blah, blah. And I put it in an envelope and handed it over to the section commander who was collecting routinely every two weeks or so the letters. And they would deduct the amount for the postage from our pocket money. And I forgot about it. I thought I'd handed over the letter and it was, a, you know, everything in jest. And after about a month, uh, we came back at backup time and back to our wings. And there was a lot of rush at the letter rack. And my name was being called out constantly. Where's Kassel? Where's Kassel? And somebody was holding a letter. And I wondered uh, who the, who had written the letter and everybody is, you know, uh, gathering around the, uh, I had almost forgotten that I had written to Neil Armstrong. And it said NASA, as uh, I've shown you the picture from NASA. And I opened the letter and it was Neil Armstrong. So I've kept that letter. And uh, interestingly, after about a year, Neil Armstrong just went silent. No autographs. He went reclusive. No interviews. Right till the death. I think only on the anniversary, he was invited to the White House, the 50th anniversary or uh, 45th, I don't recall. Uh, other than that, he stopped seeing the press and he was a complete recluse. So the letters or the pictures that he signed were only during the you know, first year or so, from 1969 to about 1970, 71, and after that, no more. So this is one of the very rare letters, and uh, you know, I've, I've kept it uh, as sort of a... Uh, you know, quite a keepsake uh, with us at home. So you don't have it framed or anything? That'd be like on my wall in my office. <laughs> uh, I don't want to expose it to light because, you know, the blue ink just fades away. So I have it, it in my away. file. Show it to my friends sometimes. But can't keep it out of the light. Yeah, I think like, uh, yeah, if I had a friend over, I'd be like, look at this letter. <laughs> yeah, I'd bring it out straight away. But uh, uh, I, I wrote to Adolf Galland also once. Okay. Yeah, commander in chief of the Luftwaffe fighters, mm -hmm. and he sent an autograph picture to me in a letter to me. That wow. also is, yeah. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. But, uh, uh, Kaiser, I just want to thank you very much for coming on for this live Q and A because um, this has been brilliant, and we've had some great answers for yourself. And I want to thank everyone in the chat for coming in because some of the questions were great. But hopefully we can get you back on the channel because, as you can see, we've got so many more questions coming in. I'm sure we can hope we'll hopefully get you back on uh, to answer uh, a sort of like Q&A number two. It'll be a pleasure. Thank you very much, Mike. Enjoy it. Thank you very much, guys. Well, uh, enjoy your uh, morning, uh, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And uh, again, thank you very much, guys. And enjoy. Cheers. Cheers. And good night.